Thank you, Ed. Welcome, everybody. I'm a Queens girl, but it's wonderful to be here in the Bronx. <laughs> um, our speaker this evening is uh, Majora Carter. In the late 1990s, she took a bold step into the world of urban planning when she helped shift a plan for additional waste handling in the South Bronx towards a positive green development in the South Bronx Greenway. This is an 11-mile network of bike and pedestrian paths that connect neighborhoods to the river and to each other. She also spearheaded the first South Bronx waterfront park in over 60 years, built one of the nation's first and most successful urban green carla job training and placement systems, and founded the pioneering and highly successful nonprofit Environmental Justice Solution Corporation, Sustainable South Bronx and she served as its executive director in 2008. As if that weren't enough, she's also an MacArthur Genius Fellow, and she recently founded the Majora Carter Group to help clients connect to the value of government, business, and industry, and community. And also, I might say, she has on the most happening shoes this evening. Please welcome Majora Carter. but my shoes are fierce. <laughs> and they're even more fierce because they're actually recycled. I got them for $9 at Housing Works gift shop. <laughs> and Klein. Anyway, but enough about my clothing. But, you know, kindness, sweetness, peace, and love, that is all we dream of, isn't it? In some way, shape, or form. So thank you for sharing that. Like, just beautiful. And I also want to say that it is just so wonderfully appropriate, I believe, that Pete Seeger is being honored right here in this park today, a place that is so near and dear to my heart because the history of the place actually is embodied by Pete Seeger. He taught us and he taught me that we all have gifts regardless of how small we think they are, how small we might believe we actually are, and that we can use those gifts to make great changes you know, in our own lives and in the lives of people around us. I grew up just a couple blocks away from here when the, when the Bronx was, was burning. I'm not sure why I did burning, because it really was burning, you know. Um, the, this, this place actually was an illegal garbage dump, um, and just like the people who lived here, um, it was abandoned. You know, it was basically a former city street that was supposed to be another highway, believe it or not, that was going to go through this neighborhood. And um, we, this street, however, had been abandoned, just like the people in our community, abandoned by our government and sometimes by our own spirits to some extent. So it was fitting that this little abandoned puppy that I found actually tied up to a post not too far from here, right up the street, um, first dragged me here. You know, when we were fighting against all the waste facilities in our community, and she pulled me into what I thought was just another illegal dump in the neighborhood. And, and I remember picking through all the piles of garbage that was literally piled up over my head and standing right over there, right by that um, fence, which I'm actually glad they did not paint it over because it reminds us of, of how far we've come. And I stood there not thinking about the garbage that was behind me and looking out at that river and all I could see was possibilities for my community a way that would allow ourselves and for people of outside of this community to see us for the beauty and the hope and the possibility that I knew that we could create here. And yes, Commissioner Benepe, you did come along very easily. Thank you very much. <laughs> but even though the Bronx isn't burning, you know, nightly, you know, on the news anymore, dreams of a productive future for the people who live here do still burn. Places like the South Bronx are where you find your point sources for greenhouse gas emissions, like waste facilities and power plants and lots and lots of diesel truck traffic. And we know what greenhouse gases are doing in terms of the global context, but sometimes because that looms so large, we don't necessarily see or, or think about that it all starts locally, usually in poor communities that don't have the political wherewithal to keep these things out of their, of their communities, the kind of things that wealthier communities can afford to avoid. 
All of the facilities that I mentioned before are actually linked to the ridiculously high asthma rates and diabetes and obesity rates that we currently experience in the South Bronx and in places like it. Also living near these pollution sources, we now know that they've been, proximity to fossil fuel emissions has actually been linked to learning disabilities in young kids. And we know that young kids living in poor communities statistically are sooner ready to go to jail rather than onto higher education or even into a job. The U.S., yes, is the world's leader in greenhouse gas emissions. We're also a leader, the leader, in incarceration. 25% of the world's imprisoned people are right here in the land of the free. And that is in part because there are so few living wage jobs left here. We also have a lot less green space per person in the South Bronx than in any other part of the city. You know, you can, you can sort of get a little deluded when you look at this, this area right here, but the fact that there is so little green space collectively actually detracts from us in uh, two real significant ways. One is that places with a lot of concrete and asphalt, more than they have green space, are just plain hotter than, the, than places that have it, which means that we create these little microclimates that add to the urban heat effect, which just adds to global warming. And this grass, which is connected to the earth, is not like AstroTurf, which is actually uh, also contributing to making the climate hotter. And they also, concrete and asphalt and all those surfaces actually just channel stormwater and even sewage directly out into, into the water, the kind of things that Pete Seeger and all of his allies really desperately work to try to eradicate for so long. But there is amazingly good news. The same things that cool our cities and clean the air and protect our rivers and waterways also provide opportunities to create real great green jobs in our community. This park that we're here in today is more than just a park. I actually consider it a manifestation of a Pete Singer sing-along. It's a stormwater management tool absorbing and cleaning water before it actually even enters the river. It's a job training site you know, where people can actually learn about horticultural skills and actually apply them into jobs that they can actually do and earn living wages from. This, and, if, and then later on, you can even go and work with rocking the boat out on the river, as you're, I'm sure many of you are probably about to do. And this park is a beacon of hope and possibility, which makes it a lot like Peak Seeger. The work that I do that, that Adam Green from Rocking the Boat does and all of his colleagues and all of our colleagues do is really hard sometimes. But I have to tell you, what I, sometimes I like to think that when I am feeling that this is a, one of the most difficult lines of work that anybody could be in, all I do sometimes is just imagine Pete Singer with his, with his head, you know, thrown back, you know, talking to, the, to the, all the celestial beings and to us and uh, with his face to the sky and just reminding us all that as he sings out to the audience, and we're singing back to him, words of struggle and determination and happiness and triumph, all those things that he shared with us for decades, it inspires and emboldens me to do the same thing. If this park were a church, Pete's, then Pete's award here is kind of like the coming of the Pope. You know, this is where we celebrate the message and his love, not just for the rivers and natures, but for people, for ourselves and for others. Pete Seeger has helped us all paint a picture of the promised land to strive for, one that's not black or white or yellow or brown or red, but one that's green and blue, like our earth should be and our water should be. And we're getting closer to it every single day, thanks to the enduring leadership of an example of warrior poet singers like Pete Seeger. So thank you, Pete. And thanks to the Lillian Gish uh, Foundation for actually giving him this amazing award. Thank you. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> I was very proud to uh, serve on the Gish Selection Committee this year, and I think around the time the committee met, I was watching a documentary on Pete Seeger's life with my mother. And my mother and I don't think we have much culturally in common. And then all of a sudden, we were sitting there listening to all these songs and things, and I was saying, oh my God, we used to play those on the recorder, and then we, as a family, we watched Hootenanny, and 
the Smothers Brothers and Joan Baez and Pete Seeger. And the, we, we were a very peculiar American family, the African American family in the 50s, as I like to say. So when the committee selected Pete Seeger as the 19, uh, 2009 recipient of the Gish Prize, it meant a lot to me, as I know it means to a lot of you in this audience. And we did so not because of his major contributions to music and arts only, but because of his impact on environmental issues. And all this is part of his significant, quote, contribution to the beauty of the world and to mankind's enjoyment and understanding of life, end quote, which was outlined in Lillian Gish's will. His influence extends beyond his music, and he has used his talents not only to entertain, but to unite people, support causes from labor to the environment. Our Gish Prize ceremony in this location with Rocking the Boat, about which we'll hear more in a few minutes, evidences his commitment to the environment and to the future generations who will enjoy it. It is now my great pleasure to present this honor, the 2009 Dorothy and Lillian Gish Prize to Pete Seeger. Pete, will you come up? think that these two talented actresses who made their name and I guess their fortune back in the 1920s saved the money, saved it, saved it, and 16 years ago uh, had made sure that a gifts would be given every single year to a different artist. And they knew as increasing numbers of people know, that if there's a human race here in a hundred years, it probably will be the arts which save us. In the broadest sense of the word, not just visual arts and musical arts, but the dancing arts, the cooking arts, sports I would include. You know, Mandela brought South Africa together with the sport of rugby. And all these various arts can leap over barriers of language and leap over barriers of religion and leap over barriers of race and leap over barriers of politics. And this is why I now feel more optimistic about the world than I have been all my life. I would like, I would like Adam Green to come up and tell you a little more about rocking the boat. This extraordinary man put together an extraordinary organization. Wow, uh, I, I can't imagine, or wouldn't ever imagine, being introduced by Pete Seeger. So that is uh, a tre tremendous, tremendous honor. And thank you so much, Pete. And we're so thrilled, uh, well, obviously, that you won this award, but but more so that we could be so uh, intimately included in the, in the celebration. So uh, thank you, um, Pete. Thank you, uh, the Gish Prize, and, and everyone who's behind it. Um, for those of you who don't know, you've probably gotten a little bit of a clue by this point, but uh, Rocking the Boat is a, is a nonprofit organization. We're based right here uh, in Hunts Point, and we, we build kids, uh, but we use boats to do that. We, we both build them from scratch. In fact, a good number of, of the planks of, of uh, wood that we use to build our boats from come from the Seeger's property. We spent uh, a lot of time up there uh, sawing trees and camping out and, um, uh, and bringing big logs back with us. And, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to bring it all together here. Um, and uh, then we use those boats to do a whole range of environmental science and maritime skills. And the idea is to, to give kids tools to help develop into whatever they want to be in life. We're teaching them these very practical, technical <coughs> skills, boat building, environmental restoration, not so that they can become ship captains or scientists or boat builders, but so that they can go wherever they want. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing it pretty well. We've been serving about 2,500 people here at this point, and 
Um, uh, we have a community rowing program every every Saturday here. Over 80 people uh, a Saturday have been getting out on the water with us, and um, young people come after school and during the summer. Um, and uh, we're just thrilled to be here in Hunts Point, thrilled to pull it all together, and, and thrilled that all you guys are with us. Uh, so uh, I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, to uh, get out on the water. We're going to be out there for about a half an hour longer after the after the program's over, taking people for rows. I'm also going to be walking with people through our site and uh, through our brand new building that's under construction if anyone wants to see that. Uh, so we'd, we'd love to show you more about what we all do. And I really encourage you to speak to any of the young people wearing Rocking the Boat t-shirts um, and ask them about what they're up to because I know they'd love to tell you. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. And I think it's now my job to welcome you back, uh, back up or I come down and we play some music. Thank you.